Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, uh, I would just like to use this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for really taking the time out to be with us. As much as this is a, a graveyard shift, I promise that will make it worth your while. Um, yeah. Um, before I move into today's discussion, I would like to welcome um, our esteemed uh, panelists, uh, starting off with uh, Gordon McArthur on my right hand side, um, CEO of Bix Group. Um, next to Gordon, we have uh, Eleni Coldray, uh, Business um, Development Director at Equinix. And then lastly, John Owens, um, who's um, uh, Director at IPC Systems as well. Um, before we pro proceed and get into um, you know, the, 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 the panel discussion, I would just like to give um, each of you an opportunity just to tell us a little bit about yourselves and also you know, spend a bit of time with regards to what the core uh, capability or functions of uh, each of your respective um, uh, entities are. So over to you, Gordon. Thanks, Tabalo. Um, yeah, hi folks, Gordon MacArthur, uh, CEO and founder of Beaks Group. Um, we are a cloud computing company that specialize solely in capital markets, so um, low latency multicast trading systems in the cloud is uh, what we've been doing for the last 12 years. Um, based out of the UK, um, about a couple of hundred people globally. Um, we are one of the partners with IPC who underpin the JSE Colo 2.0 initiative that I think we'll talk a little bit about later on. Very Scottish, forgive the accent, I'll try my best. Yes. 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 Hi everyone, uh, and I told you from Equinix. Um, Equinix, for those who aren't familiar with us, um, is a data center operator. We're the largest data center operators globally. Um, and if you're not familiar with data centers, then effectively we're a real estate business, but inside our real estate are computers. Um, and that's how the, the whole global digital economy comes together and functions. So whenever you're on your phone, on the internet, a lot of that is running through our buildings. Um, and we have over 240 of these globally. Um, we are very excited to be here in South Africa because we are opening this year in June our first data center in the Johannesburg area. Um, so that's uh, $160 million of investment that we're bringing into the country. And, and the reason that we're here today at um, uh, the JSE conference is because globally Equinix is very well known in the um, electronic trading space. So you may be aware we have 11 different metros around the world where we host um, communities that trade. So you may be more familiar with LD4, or FR2, um, if you're trading equities, we host the foreign exchange market. So I imagine a lot of your computing is sitting in our sites if you're trading globally. So um, I work in the business development function and I'm the market specialist for electronic trading and capital markets. So. Excited to be here, really interested to hear all of the trends that have been discussed today. So. Great. Um, over to you, John. Uh, thank you. Um, well, first of all, thanks for having us. It's, uh, it's great to be here and kudos to JSE for uh, putting on such a, uh, a great event. My name is uh, John Owens. I work for IPC, uh, Director for Global Exchange Relationship Management. Um, IPC is a business that's been going for about 50 years. Two key parts of our business. One is our voice trading systems business, which I think a lot of people on the trading side are familiar with because they've got IPC uh, um, turrets sitting on their desks. And then the other part of the business, the one that I'm more closely associated with, is um, our network services business. Um, and uh, we support uh, businesses from all aspects of electronic trading, exchanges, buy side, sell side application providers, information software um, vendors, enabling collaboration and, uh, and cooperation between uh, trading counterparties. As Gordon mentioned, very much part of the um, JSE Colo 2.0 initiative and uh, very happy to be part of that working you know, in close association with uh, both JSE and, uh, and Beaks on that. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, maybe just as a start, I would like to kind of do a recap and focus on some of the topics that um, were touched on earlier today by the different uh, panelists, uh, more specifically with regards to execution strategies um, and a focus on the broken model of the future. 
I think underpinning a lot of what was discussed today is really the role that um, technology will play with regards to ensuring that we start realizing um, the necessary economies of scale, um, not only from a scalability perspective, but also uh, from a cost optimization perspective. So um, we will be placing a lot of focus really looking at um, how some of you know, the, the, the tech infrastructure solutions out there uh, in the market uh, provide ease of access, um, you know, ease of connectivity, and also introducing a lot more efficiencies. I think as a start, um, you know, to kick off this conversation, I would like to focus more um, on the infrastructure element uh, with regards to um, the overall financial market infrastructure space. And uh, I guess the key question here being, you know, is cloud the new frontier? And does it lend itself to all aspects of, um, you know, uh, various uh, trading uh, strategies, e.g. high frequency trading, um, you know, direct market access, um, institutional and retail as well. So to kick off the discussion, Gordon, uh, I would like to hear your views around cloud. Yeah, sure, Tamalo. And, and listen, it's a big area, and um, the answer is cl is cloud the future for capital markets? Yes and no, right? Um, uh, surprisingly, I don't think execution or large scale execution will ever end up in the cloud, right? Um, and and I'll and I'll come on to that. You know, where where the cloud makes sense is for the front and back, uh, sorry, middle and back office, right? Clearing post-trade, all that stuff is already moving into the cloud. A lot of the bigger exchanges, especially led in the US, have moved a lot of that back office functionality up into hyperscalers, right, where latency and, and all these things are not important. Um, so, you know, the big CME Google deal that was three years ago now, it's a lot of the, way, a, a lot of the heavy lifting and the, the back office has already been done. Um, so that's where it makes sense, right? Where it doesn't make sense and where you, we, we need to pick apart the marketing from the reality is on large scale execution, right? It's still not happening. I, I, my personal view is it will never happen, right? And there's two main reasons for that, technology and commercial, right? The, the, the back office function is a cost center for an exchange. If you look at execution services, matching services. Some of these parts of these businesses are huge revenue generator for the exchange themselves. You look at a NASDAQ, you look at NYSE, co-location is three or $400 million part of their business, right? It's a 10% part of their revenue group revenue profile, right? So to simply say, we are going to walk away from that. We're going to put it up into an amorphous cloud somewhere in a hyperscaler. Um, and walk away from 10% of a group revenue, I don't think happens. Um, there's technical reasons that it, 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 it harms liquidity as well, right? So I was with one of the top five HFTs last week um, over in, in, in Asia Pac, and we were talking about it, right? And I was saying, what's your view in the cloud? And, and they said, if, if it ever moves into the cloud, our business is over, right? Because their entire business strategy is based on having bespoke hardware profiles. They put in Colo that means that they can be fast and execute and provide liquidity into an exchange. You can argue whether HFT is a good thing in general or not, not my place to argue, but it makes up 30 to 40% of an exchange's transactional um, revenue, right? 30 to 40% of the um, trades on an exchange are HFT. So if that HFT component disappears, the liquidity profile of the exchange reduces, right? So. Why would we take? Why would we, as an exchange, take the ten percent revenue hit to move into a, an AWS or a Google or a Microsoft or whatever, and then potentially risk some of the very valuable liquidity that is in the exchange? So, it's a it's like the world is cloud daft in trading, right? But you know, for me, that part of execution just doesn't make any sense, and it's and it's quite telling, right? There's no one as of yet doing any large scale execution. In a, in a generic cloud platform. And I just don't think it happens, right? So I think there's a line in the sand where that front office revenue generation part of the business will remain in Colo. And I think exchanges are now, you know, I think they realize that. And I think there's an investment case to be made to make Colo 
you know, as you've done with Colo 2.0, right? We can make Colo better, we can make it more profitable, and we can make we can make it easier for uh, for the the community and the ecosystem. But I think the back office moves, and the front office execution stays. And thanks um, for for that um, you know feedback. I guess what you're essentially highlighting is the fact that there is room for you know niche uh, private cloud providers and certainly hyperscalers as well. Um, you know, with regards to looking at how we enable not only the FMI infrastructures, uh, infrastructure providers, but also you know market participants to 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 to, to be a lot more efficient and you know, realize our cost optimization because cost is quite key. Um, I guess maybe one other point I would like to highlight, and this is an emerging trend, you probably touched on it um, in your response, is, um, you know, this space where we're starting to see a lot of the hyperscalers um, get into the low latency space Etc. Um, trying to solve for ultra low latency and so forth. In your view, do you believe that you know if you kind of take into consideration some of the more complex uh, and latency sensitive um, capabilities such as uh, uh, processing of multicast data, yeah, uh, etc. and so forth, um, is that something that you feel? is probably uh, something that is a long way from being achieved uh, within that hyperscaler space. I mean, so multicast is still a problem with the hyperscalers, right? Precision timing is still a, still a problem. Um, you, you can't get around the physics of it, right? You, you, you know, to have a, a low latent, ultra low latency environment, you need to be in the exchange building, right? So, so our strategy is different. It's, it's we are trying to enable the exchange, as we're doing with you guys, the exchange to become the cloud themselves, right? We you know, rather than moving, you know, four or five milliseconds away into a hyperscaler cloud, we put a cloud platform into an exchange and allow the exchange to offer that to the members, make it easy. And then the latency profile is, you know, you can have an ultra low latency profile, multicast enabled platform within the exchange data center, right? And it's it's a slightly, it's a pivot on, you know, how you deploy the cloud. We are saying to the exchange, keep the revenue, Keep control, but enable yourself to become the cloud, right? And, and multicast and PTP and precision timing and latency are not an issue if you go down that route. It's all there. You're still in the same building. Thanks. Uh, thanks for those uh, valuable insights. Elemi? Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on what um, Gordon was saying. I think we our exchange is going to move to the cloud. Like the experience so far is that you know, clouds are going to come into Colo, to your point, and that also goes for the hyperscalers that want to address the exchange ecosystem. Trading does happen in the clouds. It happens for crypto, um, you know, and it is a frustrating experience if you are a trader that has built a technology stack to interact with a sophisticated, regulated, highly liquid market to try and trade something that's based in the cloud across non-deterministic networks. So you have no idea at what point your market data left the exchange and has hit your server, your VM, or your server in, in Colo. You have no idea how long it's going to take you to get back to the exchange. You just can't run the algos that you need to run in, in that scenario. And like furthermore, you know, we, we have you know, the same kind of HFT and prop traders that come to us saying, how do we get those exchanges out of the cloud? How do we bring them into Colo so that we, we can kind of interact with them? Because the issue you have, if you have a, a crypto platform that's trading inside AWS, and a lot of them are sitting in AWS Tokyo Zone, for example, the AWS Tokyo Zone is made up of 20 different data centers, some of which sit in Kyoto. So that could be 200 kilometers apart, right? And what happens is that twice a day, AWS refreshes the VMs, and suddenly it moves. So what you find is that the exchanges, the crypto exchanges, are, are moving around twice a day inside one single cloud zone. And so where do you point your network? And so the latency is changing constantly and there's no predictability. So there are solution providers out there trying to solve for that, but it's just not an uh, ideal scenario. And so I think the proof point is you know, NASDAQ as an exchange, highly technology driven, obviously the big announcement alongside the CME Google deal, NASDAQ with AWS, 
And NASDAQ is the first exchange that has moved a few of their markets onto AWS. But if you read closely, what they actually have done is they have brought AWS into co-location. And so AWS Outpost, physical servers, it, it's on physical machines that the three NASDAQ options markets are running. And these are not highly liquid markets. So it really is, you know, what type of market are we looking at? You know, the, the equities markets, the derivatives markets, they're not moving any time onto a cloud-based infrastructure. Um, and even, you know, I think regulated exchanges, e even some of the less liquid markets, the cloud is coming to Colo to meet you and it will be available for the exchanges to run technology on and, and sort of market participants that aren't sophisticated and, and running bespoke hardware from top to bottom and bespoke latency networks, they might find a comfortable home on an outpost, but it would be perhaps at a price point that they might not want. But um, so I think the picture is mixed okay. um, and the picture is hybrid cloud and potentially multi-cloud, but reintegrating the value chains as Gordon said between front, middle and back office is, is I think the, the place where there's a lot of work happening to kind of build resilience um, and operational efficiency. So you work across the chain and across the clouds and across Colo. Um, and then I guess, John, anything you want to add from a private connectivity perspective with regards to? Yeah, so uh, I very much echo uh, everything that both Eleni and Gordon has been saying, but I think, um, you know, is um, cloud the new frontier? Yes, no. I kind of agree with you on on there on on that call. But if you know, if I reflect the views of the customers that we deal with today, and where they're going in the next short term future, I think the big challenge that they have at the moment is how do we manage this hybrid cloud environment? So you have you have different clouds which serve different purposes. Um, so for high frequency trading, that's going to be in an exchange colo space because the laws of physics, everything demands that it needs to be uh, in close proximity to the exchange. Um, you have analytics platforms which work very, very well in a, um, in a public cloud environment. And, um, and then the consumers of both of those services, whether a trading firm or whether they're um, uh, an application provider or, or an ISV or you know, buy side, sell side, whatever, whatever it happens to be. The challenge that they've got then is how do I manage those disparate parts? How do I manage that multi-cloud environment? How do I, uh, how do I uh, get the best out of um, uh, reliable services, do it cost efficiently, um, and do it in a way that I can scale it as, a, as a business? That's what we're seeing, you know, the, 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 the demand, you know, for the here and now. And I see that probably carrying on for, you know, some time in the foreseeable future. I don't think we're going to see everything moving to um, hyperscale environment. Um, uh, I, I, I don't think that will ever happen in totality. I think you know more of it probably will, but I don't. I don't see it happening in the short term. Great, thank you for those uh, uh, valuable insights. Um, I just want to touch on some of the the, the trends that we we see emerging, um, especially when it comes to you know some of this collaboration or partnerships that um, we've seen quite a lot. Um, is there something that you'd like to share um, on your end, Gordon, in terms of um, you know some of the, the, the future trends you're seeing in your space? Um, yeah, so I mean, we talk to a lot of exchanges globally, you know, you, as well as, as 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 down here, and a lot of the things we're seeing is exchange consolidation. You know, if you look at what's happening in LATAM, um, you know, there's you know the exchanges are moving together to try and get to a point where they have a, a critical mass. And that has a real impact on the technology footprint that they're doing, right? You're bringing three or four regional exchanges together. There's a Middle East initiative. I know there's an African initiative as well. So there's going to be some big moves in terms of exchanges consolidating into within a region. How that happens, you know, I guess every region will be different. But it's going to have a real your complete change in, a, in the technology that you know is used because each, each exchange is using individual technology stacks and there's going to be have to be some uniformity they're going to have to pick where they're physically going to reside in, in regions so some of that stuff's really interesting over the next you know five to ten years because you know that the disparate exchange you know um uh, kind of roadmap that we see or platforms that we see um is going to consolidate down a little bit so you know, I'll have a real impact on technology. I think the cloud will continue to play a role, um, and you know, compute and you know all the you know advancement in computing is still continuing, right? Um, so, 
um, there's a lot of condensing of infrastructure still to happen. I think there's, um, I, I, that, that's an interesting space to be in. So, but yeah, the exchange consolidation is going to be an interesting one. Okay. And then Yelena, in your space? Uh, from an exchange perspective, I mean, I think we've heard about it in the talks earlier today as well. You know, there is a real interest in going global and trying to build a, a global platform. And we, we see that from, I guess, from a personal perspective, when you're making your own investment choices, we, you know, we're all thinking, you know, where are the opportunities around the world and, and how money is being allocated. So we, we typically have a lot of conversations with our exchange customers about where are where are the new frontiers in terms of wh where's the next investor base going to come from? Um, where's the liquidity? Who's interested in the market data just to start consuming and um, learning about the market, whether that's to you know, trade remotely or whether it's to come in country. So, so getting access into the global financial centers and getting yourself closer to that international audience is a really big theme. Um, the, the cloud piece continues, um, you know, the particularly some of the exchange groups that run really large kind of data products and analytics sets, et cetera, you know, they, they are consumed both kind of, you know, in, in co-location and, you know, in the ground and on desktops, but they're also consumed in the cloud as well. So we help our exchange customers, and our market data customers build a backbone into the cloud where they can um, create their, their cloud-based um, product set and their cloud-based solutions, and they can meet customers in the cloud. So I think that's a really important thing, is meeting customers where they want to be met and how they want to consume the service. So that means both geographically, but also on an infrastructure basis. Is it in colo? Is it in cloud? Is it in your office? And so kind of to John's point, creating a network mesh that allows you to be everywhere with the right latency and the right performance is really key. So those, those kind of problems are, are what our customers bring to us. Okay, thank you. And uh, I would like to maybe touch on the, the aspect of ESG oh. um, while you still have the mic. Um, so, I mean, from a power consumption perspective, um, data centers are quite power intensive and consume a lot of power. Mm. So, uh, from an ESG perspective, there's obviously that whole element relating to, you know, how we kind of um, drive down consumption or do it in a more um, environmentally friendly manner. Um, I mean, in your view, uh, how could we deliver efficient infrastructure that um, addresses um, high-powered um, environments uh, but still align with global ESG standards? That's a really big topic, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so where to start with that? So, you know, yes, data centers and networks combined might be 3 to 4% of global energy consumption, according to one of the EU Commission reports. So kind of half on data centers, 1.5% to 1.5% on the networks that are moving your data between between all of the, the data centers and your offices, et cetera, and your, and your devices. Um, so it, it is a really, a really big impact um, on on the environmental footprint that, that we all have. Um, it's something that as a data center operator where energy is by far the biggest cost on our balance sheet, it's something that has had board attention for a very long time because it's a huge cost and therefore a huge risk. You know, if we can't supply um, reliable power to our customers, then our, our business is nowhere. So um, we've had our um, sustainability strategy in place for, I think it was in uh, 2016 that we set our um, ambitions out to be climate neutral by 2030. So we are signed up to science-based targets and we have a commitment to be 100% renewable energy by 2030. So we're already at 96% globally uh, renewable energy coverage. So that's across over 240 data centers and we will be covered by renewable energy here in Johannesburg when we go live from the outset. But w we can do that piece, but I, I would really encourage everyone to think about the, the, f the full stack. You know, you're, you're consuming energy um, and, and we will do our best to make sure that our buildings are highly efficient and so our site loads are consuming less um, and so, so we, we have huge efficiency drives on the, on the power front as well as on the water side as well which is an increasingly um, scrutinized topic in the areas of data centers. Um, but then from customers that come and deploy inside our data centers, they bring the hardware, they bring the software and they run the applications and so, so there, there are also efficiencies to be had um, both with regards to power consumption, um, but also the longevity 
of the equipment that you run in your data centers, right? The circular economy. We just you know, recently see the clouds announcing that they're extending the lifetime of their servers from three to five years. That, you know, that can be a really big impact on the natural resources that are used to create um, the technologies that all of you rely on in the trading community. So um, I, think, I think there's a lot of different elements that need to be looked at. I'm part of a group called Sustainable Trading, which some of you might be aware of. It's a, a member network with over 60 um, trading firms that are members and I co-chair the um, working group on the environmental impact of trading infrastructure. So the kind of things that we're looking at are um, how you run and operate your, your data centers to be efficient um, on the energy side and customers are interested in liquid cooling and the potential of liquid cooling to reduce the energy consumption of a stack, particularly in the high powered area. Um, but then other elements are you know, are you running your trading environment 24 by 7? Or at the end of the trading day, do you, I'm not going to say turn it off, but do you power it down to a, a low power mode overnight? And typically the answer is no, because everyone's very scared about touching anything once it's live. But, but there's a lot of elements that perhaps haven't yet been considered. Um, so... I would encourage people, if, if you are interested in looking at that kind of trading estate, then there is a network out there that is starting to look at this. And you can work with your peers in the industry who perhaps are slightly further forward um, and just compare notes. And, and we're working on best practices in that area. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, valuable insights. Um, I would like to move on to the next um, aspect of this uh, discussion which really touches on the impact of AI um, in terms of uh, execution strategies. Maybe if we could uh, start off with you, John, um, can you just maybe share your insights around, around the increasing role of um, AI in execution strategies and perhaps even the link to, you know, from, from an infrastructure perspective, Yeah. Um, or do we have enough computing uh, power available to 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 to, to accommodate some of this um, you know solutions we starting to see uh, come out from an AI perspective? Yeah, yeah. AI is a very funky topic, and uh, you know every business wants to um, you know claim that uh, AI is uh, front and center in terms of their strategy and their thinking. I actually think the the, um, the capital markets industry has been at the forefront of AI before the term AI was uh, you know ever invented. I mean, if you look at algorithmic trading, quant trading, that's essentially what AI um, is in a in a, in a trading um, uh, environment. And um, you know, is it a panacea for everything? Um, probably not, but it's it's definitely going to have a big impact on the way that um, uh, the uh, the trading environment operates um, as we you know as we go forward. I think we see it at, at the moment in terms of um, uh, analytics um, and uh, both pre and post trade. I think that. AI has a massive part to play um, in in that environment, and that ties very closely in with um, you know cloud, where the compute power is going to be um, is going to be situated. If you are looking for a lot of compute power, then you know cloud is a, is the right place um, uh, to do that. Um, artificial intelligence can be um, really really efficient in terms of speeding up uh, the amount of data that's analysed and the quality of the data that um, that is analysed. Um, but we've always we've always got to remember that AI is only going to be, ever be as good as um, as the people that are you know putting the reins on it, controlling it. Because if we if we create bad AI, we're going to get bad results out of it. If we create good AI, we'll get good results out of it. So, I think it's going to be a formidable part of what it is that uh, that we do. But as I said at the start, and I think um, you know, capital markets has been at the forefront of that for probably twenty plus years. Yeah, great. And Gordon, your thoughts? Um, uh, we, we. <laughs> We are not. I agree with John. Right, AI has been in our world. Like right? algorithmic trading, you know, you've got you know market data. You're making decision tree matrices on it and placing trades. Right, that's you know that that is what AI is. So you know he's right. This has been with us for a long time. We've not had a single customer, and you know we've got four or five hundred different trading clients that that use our public and private cloud environments. We've we you know we've had zero inquiries about GPUs and. You know, really beefing up that compute capacity in you know the low latency colo space. So it's it's a bit trendy for me at the moment, right? It's not, there's nothing materially coming through in our business that suggests that um, you know people in that low latency trading space are are using the kind of you know the large language models to 
to do anything you know more advanced than they've been doing for a while so it's it's a bit of a non-event for us at the moment if i'm being honest um maybe it'll change but um i'm sure equinix you know a much bigger entity than us will you know have some level of um you know input into but you know no nvidia stuff in our in our environment yet and not a single request for it yeah so so it's interesting that you you touched on um this uh, big llm models um, um, large language uh, models, if I may put it. Um, so we've seen quite a lot of significant focus being placed on um, the quality of the data that feeds the models and uh, obviously some of the things that uh, are taken into consideration really relate to the bias, you know, can the data be trusted, what is the source of the data and so forth. Do you foresee this probably being a, a challenge um, that would be faced within the capital market space? Or is the view that, you know, the, in that particular space, you're dealing with data that is of higher quality, it's been validated, and so forth? I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, do you could tell me too. Um, yeah. uh, so, again, at the Babylon immediately we serve and what it is that they're looking for. Um, they do want high quality data. The better the quality data, um, the better the decisions they're able to make and the better the outcomes that they're, um, they're going to get. As far as the services that we provide them with, what they don't want to do is give you a high quality product and then put it on a very, very low quality network or a very low quality data center or a very low quality managed cloud um, uh, service provider because that's just going to um, uh, end up uh, ruining uh, the investments that they've made in terms of... Uh, the um, you know, the highest quality thing. So it is a um, it's it's a uh, it, it is a, a continuum from you know start through to uh, finish. And all aspects of the electronic trading um, uh, service need to make sure that they're matching the levels of quality, the standards that are expected, the latency requirements that um, uh, that exist to support everything that uh, that they do. Um, I think exchanges have been putting a lot of investment in in terms of. Uh, um, developments of, of data we've moved on you know long moved on from the days of level one and level two and I'd talk about tick by tick data being able to get access to that data and being able to store that data being able to manipulate that data and be and being able to trade on that data is very very important for um for all trading organizations um, but from our point of view being able to deliver the services that have been created um that's that's kind of what we're judged on that's what businesses come to us for that's what they expect us to provide and we have to invest in our business to make sure that we're sustaining and supporting um, uh, those services that have been developed by the uh, by the uh, the community whether it's exchange whether it's provider or whether it's um, ISV yeah and uh, you know you the quality of data in our world you, you've got to remember you know for a long period of time people have been time you know uh, time stamping the market data you know at an exchange level down to nanosecond level accuracy right that that's very unusual like the, in our industry compared to, you know, that doesn't happen in other industries, right? So we've always had, it's not probably not perfect, right? But we have, had, we have high quality data that's issued from exchanges. You have a bunch, you know, there's a bunch of, um, you know, analytics vendors now that will take it from um, multiple exchanges and, and do funky stuff with them, right? So I don't think data quality in our world is an issue, um, and, it, and it never has been. So, you know, what, what you're feeding into the models is it should be good, as, you know. Okay. Yeah. Great. Can I just, um, I think I might have a slightly different view of, of the AI because I, I do think that <coughs> it is, is, is coming in both into Colo but also in different forms. And I think if we, if we step back and think of generative AI and machine learning as the two big buckets, I think generative AI with the big large language models is where it's going to be applied on the front end. And that's going to be on, you know, if, if you're a user of an order management system or an execution management system on your, on your screens, you know, there, there's going to be an element of interpretation of signals that are coming out to kind of filter everything that you're seeing. And, and so we're already seeing implementations of that and how mature are they? That's to be debated. But you are seeing that with the likes of Bloomberg or Flextra, the different noises that are coming out in terms of the product development. And I think to the point that was made, machine learning, yes, has been used for a long time in algorithmic trading. But the distinction I would make around the machine learning piece is it, it's, it's following an, an infrastructure model that is seen across any industries. And that is when you're training these models, the training centers 
become huge. You know, you have these foundational models that you're feeding in your data room, which hopefully is clean. Um, but, but these are really big installations and the, and the huge HFTs and prop shops have been building out these, they were calling them centralized AI platforms that we might be calling them now. But, you know, up in the Nordics, you know, five megawatts compute with how many thousand GPUs for training models and, and testing them before they get actually deployed. That has existed for a while. And I think the trend we're seeing is that in the, in the banking sphere, and we heard earlier the big international say have a technology budget, they are building centralized AI platforms to, for, for all the different business units to plug into, and there'll be governance, and there'll be um, you know, shared tools and things like that. So, so that is coming. And then once it is trained, then you have the inference. And the inference happens at the application level, and that's where it goes into market and into production. And so, you know, in the world of trading, again, the algo service, we are starting to see NVIDIA boxes going into an LD4 data center. Um, it's, it's not everywhere, um, but it, there are players that are already installing them. Um, we know they're in our sites, and we're starting to get asked, okay, well, if, if, if my business starts telling me that I need to run more of these, because we are just at the start of that, what's that going to look like for my infrastructure? Are you going to be able to support it? Am I going to run out of power? Am I going to... You know, how can I grow this? So I, I think we're at the beginning, but I, I see these two two deployments in the machine learning, and I see large language probably going more into the cloud, but I think machine learning stays private. Great stuff. I mean, while we're still on the uh, topic relating to some of the technology that's being hyped at the moment, uh, I'd just like to maybe hear your thoughts around um, quantum computing. It's something that's seen as probably going to become a reality in the near future. Um, it's seen as an opportunity, but also at the same time as a threat, mainly from a cybersecurity perspective, where there's this fear of um, cryptographic algorithms being hacked or cracked um, in a matter of seconds purely because of. Um, you know, the, the, there's a it's computing capacity. Uh, I know. I might need to do the right thing. The people we need to call on are all sitting in the middle of it. And I would ask them to stand up. Uh, Should we do this? The Moscow Towers, and really nice. But you want to ask other things, please. Okay. So, um, yes. it's just going to get you off the machine. She says that off the machine. You know, what you stand up. Some of them have to show you from a content and teaching perspective. Just keep it up on the one. It's all not yet. Okay. Yeah, so we I guess it's a security thing, right? So we, we started looking at this a few years ago, but um, I think we're a little too early. Um, you, know, quant you know, quantum computing and, you know, public availability of it's still fairly limited, right? And, and you know, the ability to actually use it is, I think is not simple. We need one this stuff. So, you know, the, but, you know, the, the, the flip side is there. There's, there's vendors out there that are now build, building. We need one um, list you know, on that. Okay. 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 Keys that will stop the VPN that's being hacked. Right? That's that's a big fear that everyone has, right? Someone can go in through a quantum computer and VPN mm -hmm. and it's human. It is. That's it's perfect. Five seconds. It's more than ever. There's vendors out there that, you know, out there now that are building, you know, security appliances and devices that mitigate that, and they actually use quantum computing in the other way to, you know, scramble the keys and make it pretty, uh, you know, uncrackable, even with a quantum computer. So while one side will, you know, sometimes the develop, you know, the, the security side and the, you know, how to deal with it, how to manage that new level will also evolve and, you know, solve some of the issues. But it's still very early. We, we, we tried to PLC this with a couple of banks and they were like, the standards aren't there. We don't, we don't want to go off there. Before, this is, you need a practitioner. You know, it, it's said because it needs to be some government input. It, it there needs to be standardization. It's, 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 a, it's a big area. Yeah. But still very early days. And I don't, and I don't think it's something that people are genuinely worried about the moment. In the future, yeah. Most likely. Yeah, the team we only started tiny. Uh, we so I guess things are really good. You don't hear any questions. How it came from? So I guess things close it. I'd just like to hear your closing plans. Raise me in a national cook each of you around. So we spoke about a lot of challenges that it's out of means. Yeah, since we 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 trying to solve them within uh, the ecosystem, Egypt, the outer world, the development. Happily, they on your end, you should be for it, and the reason down and realizing the economies of scale. Ah. And last year, from a private connectivity perspective, you know, getting that into the broader ecosystem and Florida map, 
you know, um, we, 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 we provision for ease of uh, access and um, global connectivity. So are there any other challenges that uh, you typically come across um, from a client-based perspective that uh, you feel would need addressing, uh, whether it's through partnerships and collaboration? Um, yeah. How do I pronounce this? It, 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 it's, it's interesting. I'm listening to um, most of the discussions around here today, and, and two of the things that you know, <laughs> crop up again and again. Um, are about um, you know, so what's going to help you to you know, solve the issues that have been created, and they, they are collaboration and technology, um, and you know both of those things are going to um, help to uh, uh, JSE to get through the next phase of its um, uh, of its uh, evolution, um, and you can't achieve either the, would you can achieve those things on your on your own if you've got extremely deep pockets, if you've got access to um, the best, um, the best PhDs in the world, um, and uh, and you've got probably um, uh, you know an awful lot of time on your hands. Um, f outside of that, the best way to do it is to collaborate with people who um, you know you can depend on, people who you trust, people who understand this industry space very very well, and uh, and, and and people who can come together to create cost efficient solutions for businesses that are looking to succeed in electronic trading. Okay. I see our time is up, a lady in 30 seconds, and then over to Gordon as well. Yeah, so I, I guess I'd echo what John says, and, and that's our strategy has always been to enable an ecosystem of partners so that, you know, any, any type of service that you need is available in an Equinix data center. And the one thing that I would say from having listened to the earlier panels is what excites me about this as a market here in South Africa is the huge infrastructure investment that's ha happening on a digital layer. So new cables that are bringing much more capacity to help data flow in and out of South Africa up through Europe, and the cables going both East and West Africa, um, from South Africa into the Middle East and onwards into Asia. And so I feel like you know, some of the struggles about how do you, how do you cope with the fragmentation of your markets all, all of the infrastructure that, it, that is coming is going to bring South Africa closer to the international markets, and all of that competition is going to bring the cost down, and so it's going to be easier and cheaper for South Africa to connect with the rest of the world. Thank you. Anything you want to add? It's Tuvalu, it's nearly called Tilt Tank. I'm not saying it. <laughs> you know, they want to go. They want to go. So um, they Colleagues, please give our esteemed uh, panelists a round of applause. Thank you.